be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. I'm going up there. I didn't want you to be waiting while I was in transit. Here we are. Good morning. I begin today by giving thanks to God and to all of you for your concern, support, prayers and care for Susan and me and our family following my mother's death less than a week ago. We are most grateful. My mother was a remarkable woman. Twice divorced, she worked and raised three sons in New York City, pretty much on her own, at a time when this was much less normative than it is today, and it's still a challenge today. It wasn't always easy or pretty, but my mother was resourceful, resilient, and a survivor. She always found a way. I will always be thankful for my mother's faithfulness, which she passed on to her sons, and also for her gracious and generous nature. Even as her dementia advanced to the point where she no longer knew who I was and could not engage, in a coherent conversation, whenever I or any of the caregivers tending to her did anything for her, she always, always said, thank you. Even when she could barely speak, she nonetheless mouthed the words clearly. My mother's generous nature is further revealed by the last act of her earthly life. She bequeathed her body to the Albert Einstein School of Medicine of Anatomical, uh, School of Medicine Anatomical Donation Program in New York so that medical students might be better able to learn the skills needed for their art and their profession. She had made this decision years ago and taken all the steps for me to act upon this on her death. And needless to say, I have carried out her wishes which is why we've not rushed to have a funeral service for her. We will have a small family service in May to celebrate her life and honor her on what would have been her 90th birthday. This, I am confident, would have met with her approval. Thank you was my mother's constant refrain. And because I've tried to be a good son and emulate her, thank you is my refrain today in this bishop's address. In truth, there's not much more for me to say at this stage except thank you. Thank you to God, and thank you to you, the good people of the Diocese of New Jersey. Not too long ago, I discovered the wisdom of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Any know, anyone know that name? Few. He was the great-grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, founder of the Hasidic movement. As Wikipedia notes, Rabbi Nachman was himself instrumental in reviving the Hasidic movement by combining the Kabbalah, a mystic discipline of Judaism, with in-depth Torah scholarship. Nachman attracted thousands of followers during his lifetime, and his influence continues today through many Hasidic movements, such as Breslov Hasidism. Rabbi Nachman taught, quote, when a person wants to pray God, pray to God and ask for what one needs, he or she should first thank God for God's past kindnesses and only then ask God for what he or she needs. Because if one starts by asking God only for what one needs, God says, have you nothing to thank me for then? I have a great deal to thank God for and a great deal to thank you and all the people of this diocese for. Thank you for the opportunity you have given me to serve as the 12th bishop of this historic diocese. Thank you for the grace you have shown to me during, during these nearly 10 years of my episcopate. It has been my particular honor to work with the clergy of this diocese. We are blessed with remarkable persons who have served, who serve, as priests and deacons in our congregations. Beyond the work they do in congregations, many of our clergy offer their time and talents in the wider commissions and committees of the diocese, serve in their communities as police and fire chaplains, serve in prisons, as hospital chaplains, or in other significant ways. 
The clergy of this diocese have shown throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, adapting and adjusting their ministries to meet the needs of the people of God across the diocese. May I ask you to show your appreciation for the clergy? It is, it is also true that we are blessed with remarkable lay leadership and support, and those of you who give your time so freely and generously in so many ways, thank you for that and for your supportive initiatives, initiatives we have undertaken together over these years, our commitment together to form disciples of Jesus Christ to carry out Christ's mission of reconciliation in the world. Thank you for allowing me to call Canon Rob Drosty more than nine years ago and for supporting the great work he's done with the Way of St. Paul and his innovative work in building the coaching network. Thank you for Ann Delgado and the work of the Lifelong Christian Formation Committee. Thank you for your commitment to being an anti-racist diocese and to engaging in the loving work, the loving work of racial justice and reconciliation, including our timely, vital, ongoing efforts toward reparations. You will hear a report on this during the business session. I am grateful to Canon Clive Sang, who serves as Canon Missioner for Black Ministries and has been incredibly generous in his leadership in many, many ways. Canon's Barbie Bach and Annette Buchanan, sitting up front here, God bless them, have been leading the way in our reparations work, both within the Diocese of New Jersey and also partnerships in a statewide effort. I should note that Canon Buchanan recently returned from Accra, Ghana, where she served as a lay representative of the Episcopal Church to the Anglican Consultative Council, one of the Anglican Communion's four instruments of communion. This is a big deal, and we should acknowledge it. Annette, please stand and be recognized. I also want to recognize Canon Noreen Duncan, who recently stepped down as a member of Executive Council of the Episcopal Church after years of service. Thank you to Noreen. Yeah. I want to thank Canon Karen Moore, Father Mark Smith, co-chairs of our Anti-Racism Commission, as well as all the trainers and members of the Commission for the incredible work they've done in developing both in-person and online trainings that are making a real impact, not only in the Diocese of New Jersey, but across the wider church. Now, whenever our online training is offered, you can be sure there will be participants from other dioceses of the Episcopal Church and even other parts of the communion. Thank you for your ongoing support of Hispanic Latino mission and ministry and of canon missioner for Hispanic ministries, Ramon Ubiera, who's over here doing translating work today. Yeah, we can acknowledge Ramon, please, thank you. And also for your support of the Hispanic Commission under chairs, the Reverend uh, Toribio Rodriguez and Canon Sebastian Vasquez, and the Hispanic Coalition under the chair of the Reverend Joan Mason. As most of you are aware, in a time of church decline in most areas, there is substantial numerical growth and faith growth that we can point to across the diocese through our areas, uh, through our ministry in this area. We now have 15 congregations who have engaged in meaningful work in Hispanic Latino ministry and at least five more are in process. I want you to know we're in the lead in the Episcopal Church on this. I've said it before, the rest of the church, we all have much to learn from the Hispanic Latino community about evangelism, faithfulness, family ministry, and growth. It is true. Let those with ears to hear listen. Thank you for supporting the evolution of our diocesan school for ministry, fearlessly led by the Reverend Genevieve Bishop. I think she's over there somewhere. A changing church, a changing church and changing times demand new and creative solutions to forming people for both ordained ministry as well as more vibrant and engaged uh, lay ministry. 
Our diocesan school for ministry is first rate and will, I am confident, become increasingly vital to the needs of this diocese as it prepares people for the diaconate, for late vocation or bivocational priesthood, and for meaningful lay ministries in ways that meet the needs of today's church. Thank you for Canon Connie White, Father Steve Connor, Canon Jack Belmont, Pat Hawkins, Pat Jackson, and all others who work tirelessly through the ordination process with persons who feel called to holy orders. Deacon Lynn Johnson's in that list. Thank you for supporting the launch of Episcopal Community Services of the Diocese of New Jersey. How grateful I am to the Reverend Canon Joan Mason, Ms. Charisma Uviera, and to all those who served on the initial advisory committee to get this off the ground. ECS has now raised more than $650,000 granting more than $300,000 of this thus far to 25 Diocese of New Jersey congregational ministries and projects, supporting their local efforts to meet human needs and foster gospel justice in the communities they serve. This work includes feeding ministries, stable housing support for victims of domestic violence, educational initiatives in underserved communities, immigration ministries, and more. ECSNJ is becoming a networking center of best practices in human needs and justice ministries in the diocese, offering educational summits and advocacy opportunities on topics that have included housing, food insecurity, the rights of the homeless, and urban revitalization. Thank you to the 24 of our churches which have led the way as founding congregations, making commitments of at least $10,000 each. Thank you as well to so many of you who have been individual donors to ECS and J. We are blessed that Deacon Tricia Thorne is now the executive director of ECS and J, and that Dr. Rosina Dixon of St. John on the Mountain Bernardsville is chair of the advisory committee. My deepest thanks to them and to the Reverend Dr. David Snyder, who has been amazing as the part-time development officer of ECS and J. He has been incredibly generous with his time talent, and treasure in this enterprise. We're blessed that Bishop Alex Sally French is with us today. She will be greeting you at the beginning of the business session. I'm thankful both for her willingness to serve as the 13th Bishop of New Jersey and for the relationship we've already begun to form in these early days of transition. Please, please keep Bishop Elect Sally, her husband, the Reverend Clark French, and their children, Jack and Libby, in your prayers during this overwhelming time of transition for them. This is an appropriate time to acknowledge and thank co chairs of the Bishop Search and Nominating Committee. Beleta Wynn Guerrero, I know she's here. Father Matt Tucker is also back there somewhere, I saw him. Uh, they have done incredible work, and also all the members of the committee. Uh, they were incredible and offered us an outstanding group of nominees. I also want to acknowledge and thank Father Jeff Roy, who served as chair of the Episcopal Transition Committee, but felt it necessary to step down, and also to thank Beleta Wynn Guerrero and Canon Ron, Canons Ron Pollock and Valerie Balling, who are now co-chairs of the Episcopal Transition Committee and those serving on their team. They did the work that led to the meet and greets as well as the election itself. They're assisting both Bishop-elect Sally and her family as well as Susan and me in having smooth transitions. Bishop-elect Sally is coming into office at a time of significant challenges for the church as a whole and for the Diocese of New Jersey specifically. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a changed society and a changed church. Yes, the RRR task force chaired by Canon Dr. Phil Lewis and the Reverend Canon Valerie Balling issued its final report in October. And the testings and vaccines task force chaired by the Reverend Marshall Shelley, which did such an effective job through the height of the pandemic have closed out their work. I am grateful for all that they did and also for the work of Father Greg Wilson and Rosalie D. Simone Weiss and others who established a warm line for clergy and lay leaders and who continue to provide emotional health support, even though the warm line has now been officially closed down. Despite all of this, we continue to live in an environment impacted by COVID-19. 
If we had any certainties prior to March of 2020, they have now been unsettled. None of us is in a position to know what God has in store for us as a church or as a diocese. But we do know much has changed. Nonetheless, God calls us to be faithful. Always faithful. You'll hear that in tomorrow's readings. Faithfulness, like Abraham. There are significant challenges. Most of you are aware the budget that will be placed before us for the 2023 fiscal year includes a high drawdown from investments of $1.3 million. A portion of this is due to exceptional one-time transition expenses, some but not all. Other factors have negatively impacted the budget. Father Bob Fitzpatrick and our wonderful project resource team have done outstanding work in supporting the stewardship efforts of our congregations. Nonetheless, congregational income has been down, and this necessarily means diocesan income is down. The missional needs of our congregations have increased, as reflected both in the Board of Mission requests and the demands placed on the Mission Renewal Fund. The mission and ministries are all important, but the diocesan community cannot sustain these kinds of drawdowns over the long haul. We've been in this kind of position before in 2017 when we faced real challenges for the 2018 budget. At that time, at my recommendation, we deferred consideration of the proposed budget for 2018 and created a diocesan process of charrettes. Charrettes, some of you may remember, are meetings in which stakeholders work together to solve problems or challenges. Our charrettes were designed to engage the wider diocesan community in a process of conversation, prayer, and discernment to consider together our diocesan priorities and create an effective and realistic budget. In 2018, this did involve cutting expenses and some staff reductions, but we did it. At this diocesan convention, I am re recommending the diocese plan for a similar diocesan-wide discernment pro process. I believe the 2023 budget that will be placed before you should be approved as is. As problematic as it is, it has been carefully thought through and developed. There is certainly no room to add to it. I also urge that convention table consideration of a 2024 proposed budget until the wider diocesan community can engage together in prayer and conversation about priorities and direction through a process of charrettes. This should take place only after Bishop Alex Sally is in place in the diocese so that the work includes her vision and priorities. I am further proposing that a special convention be convened in November here at Trinity Cathedral to consider and pass a 2024 budget that reflects diocesan priorities under our new bishop a budget that is more sustainable for the future life of the diocese and that is more responsive to a radically changed context. I believe this kind of two-step process is essential. The convention floor is not a good place to develop a budget. It doesn't allow sufficient space for prayer or considered thoughtfulness. I am confident that with trust in God and faith in the work of the Holy Spirit, the faithful people of the Diocese of New Jersey will find a path forward. God is good. And all the time. Amen. God will lead us all into God's own future. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus chides his disciples and chides us in today's gospel reading. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's a teaching. Easy enough. Be perfect. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The surrealist artist Salvador Dali is quoted as saying, quote, have no fear of perfection. You'll never reach it. <laughs> He's right, of course. There is only one who is perfect. In his commentary on this passage in Matthew's Gospel, biblical scholar Douglas Hare writes, quote, it seems likely that perfect is intended by Matthew specifically with reference to love. 
Matthew's understanding seems to be you are to be all-embracing in your love, in imitation of God, whose love embraces all. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, none of us is perfect, and we're not likely to be, but we can strive to love perfectly. We can strive to love perfectly. Loyal and true love acts in this way. The great English mystic Richard Rolla once wrote, as an act of human will. Too often we don't think of the work and willfulness that love requires, but it does require work and willfulness. Love is first of all a grace and a gift of God freely given, but once given, we are stewards of the gift. Too often we don't think of the work and willfulness that love requires, but it does require work and willfulness and a ton of God's grace. It also requires patience, humility, and gratitude. A lot of thank yous. And also, I'm sorry, to God and to one another. The work we're called to do together as the people of God that constitute the Diocese of New Jersey is the work of love. God's love. Love one another as I have loved you. Jesus says to his disciples in John's Gospel and says to us, He could have said, love one another perfectly. I have a few more thank yous. Over these nearly 10 years, I've been blessed with a remarkable staff. I'm grateful to each and every one of them. This is an incredibly dedicated and devoted group of people who always go way beyond what any of us should expect. I must lift up a few by name here because they'll be retiring soon after I do. And two of the three have combined service to the Diocese of New Jersey that is five times longer than mine. What a gift they have been to me and to us. And of course, I mean Canon Mary Ann Rhodes, who has been my bishop's assistant from day one. I don't know if she's in here right now. Uh, come on out. Come on, come on, come on. She's there. She's there. Yay. And let it be noted, she served four bishops before, she, uh, before, before I um, ended up being educated by her. Uh, <laughs> uh, the second, of course, is Canon Ann Noddy, our office and convention manager. She has more than two decades of service in this diocese, and rounding out this threesome is Mary Ann Clisham, who, though she's not served as long in her, as the other two. Is she here? She's still behind a desk somewhere. <laughs> we'll get her out here. She's coming. She's coming. She's coming. You know, she's, uh, she's not served as long as the other two, but has been an incredible member of the team and shown remarkable energy and commitment driving up from Salem on work days. Yay! What a threesome. What a threesome. Thank you all. In addition, I also want to acknowledge and thank Canon Phyllis Jones. Who's, yeah, go ahead, please. She's driven countless miles with me and endured more meetings than one can count. Thanks, too, to Canon Joanne Izzo, who's been a blessing to me and to us all. She's in the back. Yay. Canon Steve Welch. Canon Steve Welch, who has worked tirelessly to help the diocese and many across the diocese to adjust to our COVID-19 context with online worship, Zoom meetings, and a host of other challenges. I'm thankful for his work among us. These exceptional people are incredibly dedicated and, again, work enormous hours to serve God and the people of this diocese. 
We are also blessed with the phenomenal Chancellor of the Diocese and Canon Paul Ambos. Now, you know, that picture on the screen was taken at the beginning of my ministry. Look what I've done to the... <laughs> Look what I've done to you. <laughs> Paul gives countless hours of his expertise to the diocesan community in ways that are often underappreciated. He is one of the top canon lawyers in the Episcopal Church, if not the same. And I'm most grateful for his ministry. Um, lastly, and I'm saying lastly, I have three honorary canons I'm also going to recognize after the address, immediately after the address. So uh, those who know you are being nominated, I haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> lastly, I want to thank a person who unfortunately can be with us today. She ended up with an intestinal virus overnight, but I want to thank a person who means more to me than anyone in the world and who has been my steadfast partner for better or for worse in life and ministry, Susan Stokes. Susan's contribution and importance in this ministry are often unacknowledged, and especially by me, but they've been vital, above all, to me. Whenever I give a greeting card to Susan for her birthday or anniversary or Valentine's or any other occasion, I always put the verse from Tobit that was read when we got married, when we were teenagers. We're coming up on 47 years. I always put the verse from Tobit that by God's mercy, she and I may grow old together. That was read at our wedding nearly 47 years ago, and I've used it every year since. And we're getting there. <laughs> Susan, I love you and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. In a book of his own essays, Roman Catholic priest, theologian, and writer on spiritual matters, Ronald Rollheiser, quotes author Morris West and observes, and the clergy will recognize this, I used it when we met in a clergy conference, but he observed, quote, at a certain age, our lives simplify, and we need only have three phrases left in our spiritual vocabulary. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was certainly true of my mother, and especially in her last days. It is also where I find myself in this transition moment in my life and in my ministry. I am profoundly thankful for all the blessings of this life which God has bestowed upon me in my ministry and as my time as bishop. And as that draws to a close, as God prepares to make all things new again under the leadership of Bishop of New Jersey, Sally French, I am deeply grateful. You have been patient and generous and forgiving with me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you and keep you.